I'm coming from a canyon down below. Whoa! Alright, that's not funny. <laughs> I keep trying to start the podcast in the way they'll grab our viewers. Because you need a hook. But if they're already listening, then why hook them even more? You should just rely on your natural charisma. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Well, I don't know. I don't know if this movie sapped the charisma out of me, but we'll get to that. <laughs> Welcome to the Wages of Cinema. We're back with a new review of a movie that I saw and Corey didn't. Correct. <laughs> and we'll get into that for the multiple reasons there are. Let's just. Well, the short version of it is we have differing opinions about whether or not we should be going to the mo regular movies at this time. That's totally fair. And, yeah, in case you didn't look at the title and just decide to click on our podcast because you saw, hey, new episode. Uh, yes, we're talking about Tenet, which, you know, oh, my God, it's so deep. You could say it backwards and forwards. It's the same title. Give this man an Oscar right now. <laughs> no, but before I go forward, I want to just stress something that I think is pretty important right up front with, with everybody, which is that Tenet is now playing in theaters, and I don't know if it's playing in every state in the in the United States right now. I think it just, um, there are still some states, like I think New York might still not have movie theaters open, and New Jersey literally just opened movie theaters today, which is how I, I was able to to go into a theater to see it. Um, and it's actually not the first time... If you count drive-in theaters as a movie theater, though, we did see a couple of drive-in movies over the summer. That's true. And actually, what's funny is, for reasons I'm sure I'll discuss, I don't think I would have seen this movie in the theater even if COVID was not a thing. And then COVID was just that extra thing I needed to push me into the right. definite no <laughs> All right. I was almost certainly not going to see this movie once the reviews started coming in, even if we were not in a pandemic. Yeah, and of course, I'm going to get into my review, and of course, but what I wanted to say, though, with all this said, again, it's playing in theaters. Me going to see this movie, that doesn't mean I'm saying, you know, whether you're interested in it or not, I made my own decision to, to go see it. it. You should not feel the pressure to go back to a theater right now if you don't want to, if you don't think it's safe. And I'll start, before I get into the movie, I'll talk a little about my experience seeing it yeah. and what the theater experience is like. And um, and then, you, you know, you can judge, you can decide for yourself. Um, and the funny thing for me, though, was I I have a slight, I'm going to have a I have a slightly different experience than probably a lot of you will have if you do go back to a theater because I didn't see this at a Cineplex, um, which would be you know now is the typical way a lot of people go to the movies. Um, there's a there's a town there's a movie theater in the town of Teaneck uh, in New Jersey, which I I like to go to still on, on occasion. For large part because of cost, it's like the cheapest theater around, and it has been for my entire life. In the past, it's sometimes been to uh, a fault because the theater could be kind of crappy. But hey, you know, you pay four dollars for a movie ticket, you get what you pay for. Um, and right, and these, and when you go to a matinee before six o'clock at this theater, it's five dollars, like all the time, whether it's weekday or weekend. I feel like I got my money's worth <laughs> at $5. Again, I'll get into the quality of the movie in a minute. Um, but this theater, it's... You go in and... I should say, it probably hasn't ever been cleaner before. Okay. Since I've ever gone there. It was very clean. I went to the bathroom one point before the movie started, and it was spotless. <clears throat> the one thing that I think is probably different, though about going to this theater than a Cineplex, uh, they didn't check my temperature, and I didn't necessarily see them, like, wiping down stuff all the time. They might have been doing that maybe when I was in the movie. Um, and, but everyone had on masks. All the employees had on masks. There weren't too many employees, actually. And <clears throat> in the theater, ultimately, there were about uh, maybe seven or eight people that came uh, at the start there were maybe like five or six and they were they were scattered out throughout the theater 
I think three people all the way in the back were kind of sitting together, maybe because they knew each other. But other than that, people were sitting separately. And I, you know, there was one guy who kind of sat, like, in the row behind me, but way off to the side. So I wasn't near too many people. Um, I do have one sh maybe shameful admission to make. I, before the movie, I bought a mini popcorn. But I ate the whole thing before <laughs> the movie started. Okay. <laughs> and then for the rest of the movie, I left on my mask. So okay. if in case you're wondering, like, oh, wait, are, can people, you know, eat in the theater or drink in the theater? Yes. I mean, I can't speak to how many other people in the theater had on masks because I wasn't constantly checking. I think maybe three people... At the, when I looked at the start of the movie, didn't have on masks, but everyone else did. So, I, my <clears throat> opinions, I want to ask you about this. The primary reason why I do not want to go to the theater myself outside of a drive-in is, A, I don't want to wear a mask for that long. It will distract me. It will bother me, and it will distract me from the film. Now, the difference between you and I is that You've been hustling out there the whole time, working out in the world, even during the peak of the pandemic. So you're used to wearing a mask for hours and hours. Yeah. But those of us who have been living that cushy work from home life this whole time, like mm. I have, we're just not used to wearing the mask for hours at a time. See, I see. I got to the point where I. This might sound weird. I forgot I had it on. I went. I went through. I would occasionally be like. You know, I'd have my hand on my, you know, I'd put on my face or something, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, a mask is there. But, you know, I'm watching the movie, and, you know, things about the movie aside, I I was able to, you know, look at the screen that worked. Now, and also for you, too, because you wear glasses, that also makes That's it a little bit more difficult. That's the other thing, too, that if there are any four eyes <coughs> listening to this podcast, you know, when you're wearing the mask, Sometimes your breath fogs up your glasses. And I mean, there are things you can do to circumvent this, but it's a continual mm -hmm. problem if you wear glasses. So And you're not and you also don't want to not wear a mask in the theater too. Like you wouldn't go into the movie theater and just be like, "Eh, I'm not going to bother with the mask." Well, that's the other thing. So my my t my two main reasons that I do not want to go back into the theater is a I don't want to wear a mask for hours. Second reason, which is closely connected to the first reason, I don't trust the other people in the theater. Mm -hmm. Because before COVID, we went to the movies all the time, and I know how badly behaved people are in the movies. Yeah. I mean, you said yourself there were people there who were not wearing masks. And now, again, I don't know if they maybe put on their, back on their masks during the movie, because I... You know, I was sitting, you know, a few rows from the screen, so well, I wasn't necessarily being that paranoid about it. Now, maybe you could say, well, I should have been. Well, uh, I was going to say, if any of those people had COVID, you have COVID. Congratulations. Well, I, God, I hope not. Not for this movie. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I did. Th I did think about that as I was walking out of this movie. Uh, let's get. I'll cut ahead. I'll cut to the chase. This movie was disappointing for a number of reasons, and I did think when I was walking out, like, "Am I going to get COVID for this movie?" Well, that's the other thing. Like, we live in a world where people talk during the movie all the time. People play with their phones during. The movie all the time we live in a time where people already have terrible manners in the theater and i'm really gonna trust these now, idiots to wear a mask see my see my thought though was if i went like i went kind of in the middle of the day and my thought was okay if i go now and there aren't that many people in the theater maybe i'll be okay mm -hmm. because you know not as many people there you know not the same chance of like you know, spread. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, again, I did, it was what we call, like, I guess, a calculated risk. Yeah. And now we should mention that the numbers are also pretty good where we live because 
we got it so bad back in March and April that the numbers are pretty good where we live. Yeah, ironically, other states opened their movie theaters, I think, earlier, and they, at a time when I don't think they even had much to show except for, like, uh. Gremlins and the Goonies and, like, movies from the 80s and stuff like that. Um, now, I think, you know, Murphy is a little bit more responsible, and he opened the theaters at a time when... You know, again, I think I, I think I realized once he announced that they were going to open gyms, you know, what movie theaters were going to follow. Well, I I said it was absolutely ridiculous yet to open a gym and to not open the theater. But yeah, and I still and I think uh, being in a movie theater is less risky than being in a gym. Oh, definitely. Because at least you're not like, unless if you have a weird pituitary condition, you're not going to be sweating or panting or. <clears throat> God, let's hope like. Nobody's trying to get off during the movie. <laughs> Actually, that would not happen during this movie. Um, oh, before I get in the movie, one more thing: um, uh, the trailers. Uh, probably one of my probably one of the, my favorite moments just through this whole experience today was one of the trailers because it was a trailer I hadn't seen before uh. for a movie that at the end said "coming June 2020." <laughs> <laughs> it was Top Gun Maverick, <laughs> the, the the somehow long-awaited sequel that literally no one except Tom Cruise asked for. <laughs> the, the, a sequel, thirty-four years in the making, to Top Gun. <laughs> like, and I, you know, it's not. I'm not interested necessarily in seeing the movie, except like, uh -huh. wow, like, I, I, get, I don't know if they're using a lot of makeup or like. Irishman type CGI, but Tom Cruise still looks great, <laughs> considering he's almost sixty. And well, there is also <clears> the <throat> factor that summer mo summer movie season is not kind of peak movie season for me. Sure. So there are not that many movies that I'm missing that much. Yeah. The one movie I was desperate to see this summer, I did get to see. Yes. Drive in. Yes, we saw Unhinged, and I, we didn't review it because, frankly, I didn't think there was enough to say about the movie in the podcast. But I liked it. It, it was a guilty pleasure. It's it was a good certainly exploitation fun. Exploitation movie, and <clears throat> it's very much, and it was a great time seeing at a drive-in because it yeah. felt like a drive-in movie as you know Russell Crowe huffs and puffs uh, his way across like a, a city killing people. <laughs> it was so fun. Now, so there was only one movie this summer that I was really desperate to now, see. Now, and it, then, now, hypothetically, though, if let's say Tenet, you had heard, like, glowing, glowing reviews. Like, you heard it was, I don't know, like, the next Parasite or something. Would you have, would that have piqued your interest more? Well, the other thing about Tenet <clears throat> is, even if it got great reviews... The length of the movie put me off in this particular it, environment. It is long, and I will, and I'm absolutely going to get the, to that too. It that that was also like a point where it it was, yeah, and I could see that being a deterrent too. Like I, you know, I want, I was really, frankly, I was just craving that theatrical experience again, even at a small theater like in Teaneck. Um and I got it, and I'm I'm good, and I might you know I am gonna probably go see more movies as they come out. I'm gonna be I'm not gonna go see like everything. I'll try to be picky and choosy. Um, if I can, I'll try more to see movies during like the week if I can help it because that way that I'll also then minimize you know having people in my theater. You know, like the ideal thing would be to go to a movie and maybe only like one other person is there or maybe like no one yeah oh you know it was funny one other thing they're showing tenant on like all the screens at the teenic theater except they were supposed they well they have space jam <laughs> programmed <laughs> twice a day there but when i walked by the theater no one i guess had bought tickets so they didn't play it <laughs> They were showing Space Jam at the drive-in. Yes, they were. Unhinged. What's with this bizarre popularity of Space Jam in 2020? Uh, you know what it is. It's because they're gonna they're they're planning a Space Jam two. Oh, do you 
With that, like with LeBron. Do you know what I thought it was? I thought it was maybe tied to the release of that show, The Last Dance. What? Oh, oh, my. well, it could be that too. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Uh, and but no, I didn't know they were making a Space Jam sequel. See, this is the kind of thing I'm missing. <laughs> the, no. Yeah, the only trailers, by the way, they showed uh, were Top Gun Maverick and uh, Wonder Woman. Well, I was going to say when. Well, it's true, Unhinged was the only movie I was really desperate to see. There were a few other summer movies I had some interest in seeing. I wanted to see the Candyman remake. I wanted to see Black Widow. And I wanted to see Wonder Woman. But those movies, I didn't have a burning desire to see. Yeah, and if I and if I'd had the chance, I would have seen the Bill and Ted movie in a theater. And instead, I went with VOD. And I'm sure there are other movies I'm probably forgetting. But mm. And speaking of Bill and Ted gives me a, a <laughs> chance now to get into me talking about Tenet. Which... What's the segue? Haven't <clears throat> seen neither movie. Really? I haven't seen Tenet it, and I haven't seen the newest Bill and Ted movie. But you know like roughly what happens in Bill and... Like at least the first Bill and Ted oh, movie. Oh, which is time travel. Yeah. yeah I get it. Oh, okay. get with it. <laughs> First of like knocking on your head. <laughs> Maybe you do need to be out there more in the world. <laughs> All right. Um, Sorry. But yeah, so you did think the theatrical experience though, it was it was good. It was it was fine. Yeah. I didn't feel like, oh my god, I'm at risk or something. Uh, I just it felt like being back in the theater. It was like it was it, except for the masks, it almost felt like nothing had changed. Okay, and and now again, it might be different at that theater than you know. Maybe the cineplexes, you'll see more like people take your temperature when you come in, or that. And so, in that sense, you could, I could say that the Teaneck Theater was a little bit more lax than I was expecting. But it would also bring in less people, so it's like a wash. That too. And again, I saw it middle of the day. You know, for the type of theater that I was in, and I was in one of the bigger theaters. You know, seven or eight people spread out. That's not bad at all. Uh-huh. I didn't hear anyone coughing. That's the <laughs> other thing too. I th- actually the mo- the most I heard, you know, and, you know, brings back old times. A couple of times I did hear like a little bit of <laughs> murmuring from the back row. It wasn't like incessant, but I did hear it, and I was like, oh, I'm people talking again. in the theater. I <laughs> know, <laughs> but it felt like oh. I miss this. I miss the communal experience. I'm being even irritated. Mo- <laughs> and speed of irritation, tell it. <laughs> okay, now there's a segue. Okay, so here's the thing about this movie. So to give you a brief synopsis, because you might you might have seen the trailer, you might be seeing some commercials, and you might have seen that little like that moment where John David Washington and Robert Pattinson are in a car and. They're in like what looks like a car chase, but then a car they see is like going backwards and flipping over and doing like a cool, you know, reverse type movie special effect trick. Well, it's what this movie essentially is. It's like the John David Washington plays this character who is just named the protagonist. Vomit. Now, although. And this is my spoiler. He's not just, he's not the protagonist. He's a protagonist. <laughs> and, <laughs> he's not a <laughs> No, seriously. At one point, a character actually tells him that. He says, you think you're the only protagonist? You're a protagonist. Jesus Christ, I hate you so much already. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, he's at the start of the movie, he... He get, he he's part of this like big opera operation at an opera house, and it seems like one of those things where you know you extract somebody from a place and try to get information, but then he gets caught and is quote unquote dead. He's no more. He's been you know that ki- that the type of thing that you sometimes see in like spy stories or things like that, where you know you're no longer you don't exist quote unquote. You're now part of our secret oh kind of extra... is it like burn notice when well, a spy gets burn burned notice. and when they're burned they lose all their money they lose their identity um i guess except it's a lot more and complicated they lose their protection of the u.s government which means they yeah hunted and killed. yeah pretty much yeah you could say that like yeah he he's like quote no one 
I know. have seen six episodes of Burn Notice, so I'm yeah. into this stuff now. Yeah, and he is soon introduced to this whole concept involving time inversion. That, like, okay. time travel can, to the best of how I can explain it, Without, as as the movie tries to explain I to me, I wish people could see his face right now. Where I'm I kind don't. of grimacing a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's like the way it's explained. There's some type of technology from the future okay. that someone that people have sent actually to our time or the past. Okay. And it's it involves something with to do with physics, where you can, as long as you do it, you make the free will action. You can make objects kind of go back in time and okay. then come back again. So you can teleport them back in time with your mind. Not really with your mind. They could just, but oh, it can happen. Machine. They have a time travel machine. Is it like uh, Star Trek where they beam stuff from place to place? Not even really that. It's, there's like, all right, this is actually a little problem with the movie, but it, it's indicative of why this movie is disappointing. Like, what really is effective in time travel stories it usually is when you have some type of really cool, memorable visual device for the actual time travel. So, for example, you know, Doctor Who and Bill and Ted, you have a phone booth. Uh, you know, Back to the Future, you have the car that goes 88 yeah. miles an hour. Even in Palm Springs, which yeah. we just saw, you have that weird cave, that weird glowing cave. Which is pretty, that's pretty memorable. Yeah. This movie, it's like a series of, like, rooms with these revolving gray doors, and they're, like, very dingy, and then you wind up in, like, shipping containers and stuff like that, and it's just not very, it doesn't really give you imagination to hold on to as far as the concept, and, you know, it's, this movie is full of so much explanation. Oh my god! I I apologize, Inception, for everything I ever said as far as me complaining about your exposition. You are like a god compared to this movie. Because what happens is, this what, like what we get in the story, so again, I mentioned John David Washington, the protagonist. He has this sort of task to try to find this arms dealer who, you know, in the kind of classic Bond movie, Hitchcock type formula is, you know, getting a MacGuffin. He wants to get X thing that might cause World War III, end of the world type thing. The unobtainium. Okay. Yeah, well, literally, it's they say it's plutonium, but, you know, who cares? Fine. That's okay. All right, you, you make that. That's your trope of your movie. And then, it, John, then John D. Washington is supposed to make contact with this guy, but first he gets... He's supposed to meet this guy, but he first goes through this his wife, um, Elizabeth Debicki, and oh, and Robert Pattinson is his uh, his, his partner uh, in, in this secret shadowy spy thing, and um, and then you, so the movie unfolds from there as you know again and kind of like this is no one when you strip away all the time crap. Okay. If you strip away everything to do with, frankly, what seems almost it is a little bit of a gimmick. It is. And, and this isn't even getting into the last half hour or so of the movie, which, oh my god, that's its own killfish. The problem with why this movie is so frustrating and why I look so frustrated you did. and why I'm grimacing is because there is good stuff in this movie. Oh, wait, what's For, the good stuff? The good stuff are, like, three set pieces. Like, the opening set piece that I mentioned with this opera house. There's some good action stuff there. There's a creative thing where, like, these... these Basically, the SWAT team comes in and like shoots if like the, this, there's a there's a concert about to go on, and these SWAT team comes in shoot and comes in swarms on stage and shoots some people, and the audience is like, oh my god! But then this like gas comes in that makes everyone pass out, and is that's it kind like of a the cool museum visual. Scene in Batman at all? Not as cool as that. Well, no, of course, not. <laughs> no, no, not quite that. And there's even a there's one really memorable visual for me in this. Um, where, like, John David Washington is kind of being interrogated by, like, these two bad guys, and he's, like... And the one thing... Even this, though, reminds me a little bit of that train bit in Inception, but he's, like, on a... Tr he's sitting on... He's made to sit on this railroad track, and he's, like... 
he almost looks like he's about to like pass out and he's like almost foaming at the mouth a little bit and looks really sick and just that is like and he then eventually like tries to take like a suicide capsule but it's not really suicide capsule it's again you'd have to that's but that scene is a good example of okay you're actually showing me things instead of just explaining like the parts of this movie that really work for me best are when no one just shows the characters then doing stuff and even when it's in action like there's another set piece where um john david washington robert pattinson are trying to do this uh sort of art heist almost in this like airport and they've kind of managed to through like a series of th- of events get like an airplane to crash through into this part of the building they need so that this alarm can go off and they can go through these doors and they can get like this object you know the MacGuffin. that is well executed and it leads up to a pretty cool fight because it involves like the choreography is really well done and the the character that john david washington is fighting is in like a full swat uniform but that ends up that's the one kind of clever thing that comes back around later <laughs> excuse me um and you could see like that kind of backwards forward stuff that's happening that he's messing with and that works well and then even this one uh car chase um where i mentioned before where you see uh, one of the cars that's chasing them is going backwards and forwards, which makes it very unpredictable where it's going to go next. Like they can't outrun something that is from the future and now coming in the past in their timeline and all this stuff. So that, that stuff looks cool and it's well executed, but for at least for the two thirds of this movie, how I would describe it is like, if you go to like a family function, and you are ha- chatting with that one cousin or something or a family member who seems pretty cool on a shallow level. You can get along with him. He's kind of fun to talk to. He's a little brainy, but he's, you know, it's kind of fun. But you don't, but he doesn't let you know anything else about him. And you don't, like, there's no real heart there. It's just all surface level, like, cool. That's, like, the first two-thirds of this movie. Okay. But I was still, like, okay. It's, like, kind of, like, a three, maybe even three-and-a-half star movie okay. out of five. Like, it's still, I'm enjoying it on a shallow enough level. It's clearly, like, that Christopher Nolan, when you strip away the time stuff, wants to make a Bond movie. Okay. And it has the, the characters. I mean, it has your hero. It has the Bond girl with Elizabeth Debicki. Um... Kenneth Branagh is the villain, and he's unfortunately not as over the top as I was hoping. That's too bad. Because well, you, you see, you know him, he can do it. Oh God! Like well, you see him in like Wild Wild West, and that's not a good performance. <laughs> but that's him like pulling an Eddie Redmayne in Jupiter Ascending, <laughs> and you know he's very big in this movie. My whole role is to talk in this form of voice with Russian accent, and I am very intimidating because I speak at the same tone of voice, which maybe he borrowed that from Christopher Nolan. Because <laughs> I played you a little clip of him talking, and, like, doesn't he sound like the most boring man on the planet? Yes, yes, he does. He has this voice where he talks like this. <laughs> I, I'm, I think very deeply about time and version, and I really want to make a very deep statement about how so, we are lost in time. And I don't want to make this sound like I'm bragging on Nolan too much, because if you go back to our review of Dunkirk, I was in love with that movie. And I've generally liked all of his movies to varying degrees. Well, except for maybe one, but I'll include that. But but this movie really gets bogged down once it actually gets into fully the time travel stuff. Yeah. Like, it flirts with it, but it's mostly, for the first two-thirds, a spy movie that has this kind of time gimmick. And I almost thought that worked better than when it suddenly be like, they throw in the real time travel stuff. Do you think it would have been better off if he just made a bond movie? Yes. It also made me wonder if his bond movie would be like needlessly complicated or if he could just stick to making like cool, like chic visuals. Like, I don't know. I think he, 
I get the sense that he, you know, he made Inception, and he wanted to maybe top himself, and he just couldn't do it. And the thing is, we we watched Inception. Yeah. Not too long ago. We love Inception in this house. I like Inception a lot. I and I I feel like I want to apologize to that movie again because I what that movie had that this doesn't. And again, the, the two of them feel a little bit like distant cousins, but kind of related in that you know way of um, no one playing with a kind of genre. Because um, when you strip away the stuff in Inception that's about dreams, it's a heist movie. But a the cast is all like so top shelf, and they're able to play this script, you know, really, really well. And also, B, when characters explain stuff in the movie, it's it really does matter for the most part, and it really is it it, it you don't feel confused, but at the same time, he's not explaining stuff to such a degree that you're losing the 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 cinematic appeal of it. Now, you said there's tons of exposition in Tenet. <sighs> Even with all that exposition, were you confused or unable to follow the movie at any point? I here's what I would say about it. I think that if I strip away what he thinks he's being clever about, it's not actually that confusing. He he has a few tricks up his sleeve to try to make it like Oh, so this little bit that he flashed to for like a second, like he, at one point early in the movie, like the one thing in this movie that has heart is Elizabeth Debicki, and even that is is again, I have my I haven't been able to see my son, I want us to be able to see him again, tear, you know, which is Inception. Is there a dead wife in this movie? I need to know. No, but again, the, the whole thing of I need to c go get. My, my kid is all that matters. Again, we had that in Inception. That was enough motivation, that movie. You're just repeating yourself here. Um, but again, he has these, like, the one little thing is these tricks that you suddenly realize in the last, like, half hour, oh, this actually happened way earlier in the movie. Okay, so now these characters that are here are actually from the future. It almost feels like he's trying to get the audience to see the movie a second time. But if I'm not really caring about the characters I'm seeing here, mm -hmm. why should I go see it a second time in the theater, Nolan? Now... Chris? <laughs> what? What about the last third of the movie did you not like? Well, it, it's just like the movie feels like at some point it's done. It feels like, or maybe it, it could wrap things up in a certain way with the Kenneth Branagh character, because he's, you know, again, he's like the super, like, I'm using time, you know, in a way that I'm going to destroy the world for nefarious, you know, Russian-type reasons, you know. I woke up, you know, I grew up in a nuclear hellhole. God, the MCU tries harder than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I didn't think about that, <laughs> but, like... Ba what's his name? Baron Zemo or oh. Baron Z the the villain uh, from Civil War. Yeah, that movie is what like this movie wishes it could have. <laughs> but the, and the pr that's the problem though. It's like it's it, they try. At first, I thought they'd try with Elizabeth Debicki, but even with her, eventually, like you know, there's only so much you can do with her level of kind of cool. Oh, oh, she has one really neat moment where they're they're in a car chase and like or she. <laughs> is kind of stuck and she can't really get to the front, but because of how tall she is, like, cause she's six foot three, her tallness actually comes into play in the scene. Cause she manages to get like her leg and her foot to like a part of the car so that it can like go straight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I'm actually, I feel like, Oh, okay. So it's your tallness. Isn't just a, you know, a shallow feature of, like, no My one's... mom could never be an action heroine. Well, she has her skills. <laughs> um, but no, but the last... But what happens is there comes a point in the movie where the, like... You, you know that there's still a little bit of movie left, but the last half hour or so, or for, even 45 minutes... It just feels like it drags so much. And there's a very long, like, 
raid battle type sequence where a bunch of characters in boring military garb go across a boring field to just like kind of blow up or inadvertently blow up these buildings and to get like the you know of unobtainium and it like it also and like there and the thing is he's still having characters explain shit in the last part of this movie and I was, I, and even when they did that in Inception, I had a bit of an issue with that, but that at least, you know, worked again in the heist movie type mold that was in. In this, he, like, ha has just explained enough of the time stuff early in the movie that it's like, okay, I get it enough that when I see it, I understand it enough. But he makes it needlessly complicated in the last part because it suddenly is like, Okay, so you can go back. So I want to go back to this time. Oh no, it might be dangerous. You might do this, blah, but then and then this is not about physics and blah 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 blah. And then you just, but then no one just shows it, and it's not that complicated. It sounds like someone overthinking his path in the script. And then when you see it though in action, it's like this isn't that complicated. It's just another dumb action scene. Okay, so I. I get what you're saying, that there are all these, um... It's like someone make, like, filling a term paper with a lot of big words, but the <laughs> substance isn't really all that. Now, what's Nolan's take on time travel? Is he a multiverse guy? Is he a one timeline, but when you go back to the past, you can change the future? Or is he in the lost mold, where you can't Traveling I, back in time, uh, I, you can't change the future. I think most and what happened happened. I think mostly the second one, where yeah, you you can go back and you can, I guess, change it. But even th but even there, it's not totally clear because then Robert Pattinson, what well, like spoil? I'm gonna get get into some spoilers if I, I think can we're try. Have a spoiler tag, basically this whole review because people are really nuts about spoilers for this movie. So I think when you upload this, you should just. Put a spoiler warning on like. Well, hopefully people understand that you know if I'm talking at this length about a movie, I'm going to get in the spoils yeah. eventually. But I've been pretty spoiler free up till now, except talking about vagaries. Like what happens at about like I'd say the hour and forty minute mark. All of a sudden, dun dun dun! It turns out Robert Pattinson's known more than he's been saying, and. You know, he's known a lot more than the protagonist has known. Is he a double agent? Is not, he... not uh, kind of, but not like a bad double agent. He's just, he's gone through more of the time travel stuff than he said. And, and he why doesn't he share this information? Because spies, agent? you know, they lie about stuff. And they withhold and... <laughs> <laughs> like, again, that's not interesting to me. You gotta give me some... Either you gotta give me characters I care about, or you really have to surprise me. That's why I also thought of Mission Impossible, like the Mission Impossible movies, and I know you don't see those and you haven't seen any of the sequels, but those sequels are just really fun to watch because of, you know, A, Tom Cruise sells it, and B, the, the set pieces really are, like, extraordinarily done. Like, they are, for the most part, like, how did they do that? And there, and you know, there's not exactly that in Tenet. You just get like, oh, that's cool. Like, oh, okay, that's oh, that's neat. But again, I didn't give a shit about anybody, and they just keep saying like, and they're explaining lots of spy stuff. That's the other thing too. Of all the random things, like early on in the movie, I thought this movie would be like, I flashed to this obscure Hitchcock movie called Topaz. And I don't know if maybe your dad's talked about it here and there. It's one of the movies that people, like, even people like Hitchcock kind of say, like, yeah, that didn't work. And it's, like, a very long, it's, like, his longest movie. That one's almost two and a half hours, too. And it's kind of, it's a pretty dull, like, Russian-Cuban spy-type story with also a, a lead that's not that charismatic. And Why are so many spy stories boring? I Yeah, that's the thing. Well, you know what it is? In this movie, what what really takes the heat out of it is you look at the John David Washington character and you look also at the Kenneth Branagh character and it's just, you're too powerful. Okay. You're too, like, 
I know everything will be all right with you guys. Like, the reason why we still re talk about and remember the Inception ending is we're not sure if Leonardo DiCaprio is still in a dream or not, and we kind of care that, you know, if he is or not. Well, when we were listening to the film spotting review of this right before we started recording, they mentioned at one point the movie feels like it has no stakes, despite the yes. giant plot. It, yeah, it doesn't. That's the thing. That's why it's... It's such a... There's so much movie here, and so much of it isn't memorable. Like, another movie I thought about when I was watching this was um, The Dark Knight Rises, okay. which, you know, we did see that together in the theater, and I, there is a lot that is kind of wrong with that movie, or there's a lot where you just scratch your head going like, what? <laughs> what? That's really dumb. What? But in a way, it's memorable. You yeah. don't forget like Bane in that movie. You don't forget how Batman gets out of that cave and magically we were, gets back to Gotham. We you don't were, you don't forget things like oh yeah, oh your name's Robin. Like <laughs> the dumb shit in that movie is memorable. There's nothing like that memorable about Tenet. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, we did the Bane voice to each other for like five years. <laughs> oh god, like oh man, I was on a film shoot. Um <laughs> Like, the weekend that The Dark Knight Rises came out, I was on a film shoot with, you know, you know, people who might be listening to this podcast, maybe not, and you couldn't stop. Like, I, there was one guy who just would not stop doing I'm League of Shadows, and there's nothing really like that in this movie. Like, there's just, except for those, like, three set pieces that do have some cool stuff and maybe, like, one or two striking images, it... It's weird, because Inception, I remember hearing, like, no one say, like, oh, it took me ten years to write this movie. <laughs> and I didn't really believe him. Maybe he just, like, had something written down, and then he fleshed it out. But at least that movie had, you know, memorable characters. It had heart. It had, like, really, it had well-connected themes, because you had the whole thing about, you know, parents and their children, and it was kind of reflected in both... DiCaprio, and then also with Chillian Murphy. And in this, it's just like, if there were themes that no one was kind of trying to wrestle with, or if he was saying something about what, going back in time, or going into the future, or trying to change like a cataclysmic event, or something, it, like, this is the kind of, when I was talking about like, it gets bogged down in exposition, or in like, useless stuff in the third act, or in the last section, there's a point where Robert Pattinson and the protagonist have a conversation about if you go back and kill your grandfather, what would happen? And like Patton's like, oh, it's only if you believe that. What? No! That's not how it works! You gotta commit! Yeah. Like, uh, no, don't have this conversation at a point in the movie where we should be getting into just the good action stuff. That's where no one fucks up being like a James Bond director. Because he like has that on like a pretty good decent but shallow level for again two thirds of this movie and then the last third of it he decides oh no now i'm gonna make this like a needlessly complex time travel movie that isn't that as complex as i think it is but i'm i'm gonna leave you trying to think it was more complex and it, like because there are things that happen with this protagonist where you think okay is he about okay so he's just because how am I trying to explain this? I'm sounding so flustered. And I think it's because this main character is just really bland. And, you know, if you have a James Bond movie, you know, John David Washington's a fine actor. He is. I mean, we, we saw... Lo we love Black Klansmen. And he's really good in Black Klansmen. But that's also a character who, you know, he actually does have to wrestle with some conflict and... You know, and he, you know, has to have like moments where he changes his tone in a way that make in it has impact. In this, he's just always the hero, and he isn't going to have anything that we think will really damage him. He'll be able to get through a fight no problem. And I just, I aside from, you know, I want Elizabeth Debicki to live. I don't, or I, you know, in the generic, I want to save the world. 
there's nothing interesting about that character and there's nothing interest and the performance and i think the character lets him down as an actor yeah that makes sense he's not he, he tries to do what he can but he can't rise above just having to constantly have conversations that go nowhere except around and around the plot it's just plot 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 briscoe comes in and says stop it <laughs> Uh, it's uh, yeah law and order would say have some more fucking characters dude <laughs> now my true question does the movie ever give john david washington the opportunity to say the word white no no <laughs> no it doesn't that might have helped things a white you mean you have to you have to add the you have to add that to it the white officer yeah yeah we, no, no, we actually is. love the way he pronounces the word white in Black Clansman. Well, he's it's also the highlight of the film. Well, he's very funny in the movie too. Like he gets to really flex some comic chops that you don't think when you see him like being very like stoic and straight faced in the first part of the movie. But in this, true. he's just like constantly having to react to shit, and you know they're all just tools of the plot. It's like I'm sorry. I have a comparison. Okay. Not in terms of level of, like, convoluted plot, but in terms of the bland characters, is it kind of a Rogue One problem? Huh. Because, hmm. you remember from our Star Wars ranking, Rogue One I thought was boring as hell, because all the characters were just bland plot robots. And, like, none of them had any personality. There is a bit of that problem, yeah. And the world was also very, like, gray and dank yeah. and... Yeah, well, I mean, there are some... They do have some locations that objectively are, like... Like, they have, like, the kind of Italian seaside, like, city where, like, there are, like, there's a bay and there... You know, so there's lots of water and sunshine, so at least there's that, but... But I just, I can't grasp on something in this movie that made me really go like, oh, wow. You know, like, you know, like the hallway fight in Inception. Yeah. Or even, um, and even though it has its problems, I mean, you remember that, like, that SWAT chase in um, in, in The Dark Knight. Or, um, or even, again, Dark Knight Rises, the whole thing with Batman having to drag a bomb out to, you know... <laughs> Yeah, because some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. Yeah, I was going to say, my issues with The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises do not have to do with the movie being generic. Those no. movies are not generic. The one thing that, though, that that and this have in common, though, they're just so bloated. Like, this movie is two and a half hours long, and it just doesn't justify its length. This could have been two hours, or maybe even a little less, and... It's like you don't like that. Enti there's an if you go see the movie, you people can tell me there's an entire like almost twenty minute like siege involving like what seems like a hundred soldiers all in like military garb trying to go into this facility, and that whole part just oh uh, it this has like so much of the stuff I don't like in Nolan movies and none of the stuff that really. It's so striking. Like it, it's like he took like two steps forward with Dun Dunkirk, a movie where he doesn't have to explain that much. You just kind of feel because he knows I have all this history I'm working with, and I have you know all this stuff that people can latch on to and um, and trusted his audience. This he doesn't trust his audience in this movie. He he's like he's again. It's I, I keep repeating myself, but he's. Um, you know, there's a scene with Michael Caine in this movie. Uh -huh. You might have seen him in the trailer. I don't know, because, like, he uh -huh. shows up in a shot. Michael Caine just sits at a table and explains shit. Uh -huh. It's like, why do you have Michael Caine for this movie for that? And, you know, Michael Caine is great, and he can, you know, deliver, you know, he can read a menu and be Michael Caine, uh -huh. you know? But <clears throat> it's like... What is he doing here? He's just explaining stuff about, like, a Russian secret city or something that, you know, I, I, I just, I, I feel like actually, I almost wish this movie was longer, like, as, because there's a problem sometimes with the length of certain movies, where, either, where a movie should either be shorter 
or extend it into maybe like a mini series. Yeah. Like if this had been like a three or four part mini series, where maybe you could have spent a little bit more time with like Elizabeth Debicki and Kenneth Branagh, so you could get more out of their relationship than they completely hate each other and. At some point, she's probably going to kill him. And spoiler, he she does. Actually, that is kind of a fun moment in the movie. Well, it sounds like he wasn't very interested in character de development. He had plenty of time. The movie's two and a half hours long. There's plenty of time. Yes, there's plenty of time. But he, it feels like, or maybe this should have been a book or something where you could ha like spend a little bit of time when we're not like maybe describing some things or character stuff instead of just breathlessly you might have seen this in some of the reviews you've read where it's yeah going from one set piece to another to another to another when you do that and you're just explaining stuff all along the way and we're two hours into the movie and you're still explaining physics you know that i'm that maybe if you would explain this earlier in the movie like, then it would have been something, but it's not. I have a question for you, and I, I think I know the answer to this question based on what you've already said, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I I consider myself a fan of Christopher Nolan, but I don't feel like I love him the way most other people do. No, me, me neither. I feel like <clears throat> he has multiple movies he's made that I flat out don't like. And I find that when I don't like his movies... My problem is, sounds very similar to what you're describing, where he thinks the movie is full of gravitas, but it's just not. I'd say that's, he, he's 50-50 with that. Sometimes he does bring the gravitas, and other times he doesn't. So, Inception and Dunkirk, and even, like, to an extent Batman Begins, had the gravitas. Dark Knight... Uh, this, the end of the prestige. Yeah. No. Well, I have not seen the movie in a very long time. I even thought Memento kind of packed a punch at the end. Yeah. Well, because that movie, you spend the whole movie with that character, and you're really the 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 backward forward time, help like actually lends it like has something to do with why that character is so broken. There's not, there's nothing, but there's nothing to these characters. I think maybe no one thought by casting Kenneth Branagh, he would bring some type of something extra to this char to this character. But he, but he can't do anything. Like he gets like one moment with like a close up where he looks like very menacing. Ooh, oh, I'm afraid of you. But yeah, my. My consistent problem with these movies, when I do have a problem, and you nailed it. For me, basically, the problems are in The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, and The Prestige, where he builds these incredibly stupid plot points into his films, and then he presents them to us in such a dour, self-serious way. And it just doesn't work. Because you know me, I love stupid movies. I'm a trash panda. We opened <laughs> this podcast by me telling everyone to go see Unhinged. So, I, in fact, I would say I love well, stupid but, movies. You know, but you see, though, the, the, here's the difference. Unhinged, I think, I think is pretty, like, aware of the movie it's trying to be. Exactly. And I think I think Tenet is too to an extent. I think no one knows what this is trying to be. But he also again thinks he's making like a grand artistic point with time travel here. And man, the summer that we've had again, we had Palm Springs which used time travel in a or used time itself in a oh, very so wonderful good. way. And again, you didn't see it, but Bill and Ted Face the Music used time travel in a very clever way. And I feel like there was something else that I saw this summer that used time in a clear way. Maybe it was like a TV thing. I don't know. Uh, you might have been listening to me talk about Outlander. No, I didn't watch that. Well, I didn't watch that, yeah. but I guess that's that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, and in this, it's... Um, it's funny because it. I was actually wondering at a certain point, like, is this going to really wrestle more with time travel? 
And then finally he decides, oh, wait, yeah, now I'm going to do that. And it's too far into the movie to do that by well, now. What do you think he was trying to say about time travel, ultimately? I think in his... I, I can't get inside his head with this, but I think he was trying to, like, say that, you know, like, what we usually think of in a conventional sense of, I'm going to try to save the world. Well, you know, if, you th if it suddenly becomes too late, or you think it's too late, because there comes a point where you think, Oh my god, the villain has won. He's kind of had the upper hand over the heroes. But now, oh wait, I'm going to fight back against this idea. And other another character tries to tell him you can't like change things. But no, what if I can? And there's just not enough emotional gravitas to it. There's not enough real stuff there. There's no, there's no scene like in the in Inception where, like DiCaprio is trying to talk Marion Cotillard from, you know, jumping off that that out of that window. Yeah. And then he can't. Like that helps to ground the movie in some type of when I talk about that, um, for lack of a better pretentious word, pathos. Yeah. This movie doesn't have pathos. Your movies are allowed to have feelings. <laughs> And, like, no one is coming back at me, like, you know, time travel doesn't care about your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be Ben Shapiro, Nolan. You're better than that. Um, and, again, though, I felt that's why I love Dunkirk, because even though, like, I, I, a criticism I'd, I've heard of Dunkirk is we don't get to know the characters in that. But for me, I actually thought that that wasn't even, I, that was okay for me, because the characters had a lot of symbolic resonance awesome. like they re they and we feel like they're in this moment in history that is really awful and they're struggling through it and we're seeing that struggle and they're all kind of connected in this war scenario in this wartime and that's really interesting well when i'm thinking about dunkirk i don't feel like i had a great grasp on every character in dunkirk but what you mentioned Dunkirk itself is such a unique experience that it, there were characters that I felt like I really understand who you are based on how you respond to this moment. So in Dunkirk, I do think he was able to show us just through how they navigated one <laughs> exceptional moment in time who these people are at yes. a deeper level. Yes, exactly. And that's not something I get in Tenet. I just get a lot of archetypes, but they're, again, so surface level that by the time you try to throw these deeper ideas involving time and and slipping through things, and um, and that and it, it doesn't work as well. And when I said that, like, before, too, that this should have been longer, I... Another thing, too, that I might have not mentioned, there are times in this movie where it feels like stuff's been cut out. Mm -hmm. Like, I wonder if, you know, and I think I, it's, it's, a, it's a weird feeling because I, I have to think that Nolan's one of the, you know, few directors in Hollywood that can make a movie on this budget and has final cut. But there are times where it feels like he's, there's like a few scenes are missing. Like, it suddenly cuts to another moment and I can grasp enough where I am, but it still feels like you. there was a scene that should have been here. And it's not like an intentional, like, oh, I'm messing with you. It's just like, it feels like there was something That's else here. That's interesting, because you would assume no one would have final cut. I do. Well, maybe it is his, like, the cut that he's, like, edited to hit this length. Like, because it's exactly 150 minutes. Okay. But what I'm saying is, I wonder if he had originally a longer version and the studio told him well we can't go in and, and cut your movie but you gotta make it shorter okay like you, we can't have like a three-hour movie you know this summer or whatever it is or or eventually because of covid maybe they said we can't have a movie this long period right now well i know we didn't do it in america but when china reopened their theaters they set a time limit, and they said we will not show movies beyond a certain length. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder if that messed up Tenet in that country, if they had to shorten it, or maybe they have an intermission, or I don't know what they did. But, um, 
yeah, because well, I guess to wrap things up, because again, I've been talking about this for a while and kind of going around in circles, and I think what's so frustrating is just that if I could tell that no one else but Nolan could have made this movie. Uh-huh. It has again so like his distinctive visual style, which is weird because his style is a little bit flat at times. That he has a really good cinematographer though, so that helps. Uh, Hoyt van Hoytma, which is I just love saying that name. Yeah, say that again. Hoyt van Hoyta van Hoytma. Yeah. Uh, sir, I'll have to show you how it's spelled. That's, That's his so name. Swedish chef style. <laughs> 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 yeah, I pro- or something like that. <laughs> um, but but I but it, no one else can make this movie but him. But it's probably my least favorite movie that he's made, and it's not all bad either. Again, it has really good stuff in it. Again, I I would say that if you do go out to see this in a theater, you will have a few moments that you really go like, wow, like he's really on his game in this in this in the set piece. He's really, uh, like, him and his action choreographers did something special at this moment. Um, but he just lost himself in plot. Like, this, I, I made the joke, I think, on Letterboxd that, like, he really knows how to stretch the word count limit on his, in his scripts. <laughs> this probably has the same number of words in the script as, like, a Gilmore Girls episode. <laughs> uh, but... But it's just not that he doesn't do a lot that's interesting. And again, even with the time stuff, uh, it's I've seen a lot more clever uses with with time. And ultimately, at the end, there's not that kind of wow moment that I've felt at the end of most of his movies, or a sense of like real satisfaction. It just kind of ends. So yeah, so I, I you know, I don't regret seeing it, but I was let down like i was let down in the way that you were in an opposite way that you were let down by once upon a time in hollywood but the opposite where <laughs> there wasn't enough going on in that movie for you this movie had too much going on for me well it had too much going on in some ways and not enough in other ways yes yes that's a great way of so if i were to try to very briefly summarize your point about the movie is you would say there's not enough substance to it, mm-hmm. um, but and it also doesn't deliver enough on the spectacle. It's stranded in this uncomfortable middle place where it doesn't embrace a role as just spectacle, mm-hmm. but it um, it doesn't have the substance to deliver. Yeah, no. It, it, well, yeah, it, it, it has so much to. It has characters saying like saying so much with nowhere to go. To turn to turn a phrase on that classic thing, it's all dressed up and it has actually a lot of places to go. It's just not stuff that will will really stick with you. Like you know, even Interstellar was like more memorable than this. Like at least that had like I at least I remember Matthew McConaughey like crying like inside of a cube while looking at his daughter. (laughs) <laughs> Which yeah, sounds I, ridiculous <laughs> until you watch it, and it actually works. I did not see Interstellar, so I'm not used... So, the idea of skipping a Christopher Nolan movie is not anathema to me, because I did not see Interstellar. But, because I knew I wasn't going to be seeing this movie, I didn't shy away from reading reviews of it. And none of the reviews were spoilery, but I've read several reviews. And every single review said... Tenet is a movie that's hard to review and hard to communicate the experience of watching. Yeah, and that's... You see me struggling, and I think that's that's partly why, because there's so much that happens in the movie, but I don't know what's worth really talking about, aside from the basics of it's trying to be a slick spy movie and have a... For most of it, it what seems like a kind of fun time gimmick that suddenly takes itself way seriously and tries to become profound in like the last quarter as i said this is an ongoing problem with Christopher it's Christopher. like watching us it's like if you're we were watching you know 
one of those devils games where we're so <laughs> into it and like they're doing so well for the first two quarters and then something happens in the last like 15 minutes and it's, a it's a, like you just see them start like falling over one each other and <laughs> and maybe for a second you see that spark back and then it's like <laughs> so that's my review of tenet so again if you've seen tenet and you have any thoughts about it you can always email us at wages of cinema at gmail. Um, you know, we're on Facebook and Twitter, so you can always share thoughts with us there. If you get COVID from seeing this and then give it to me, because of course if you get COVID, I'm gonna get COVID. I'm gonna try really hard to guilt you for it, but it's only gonna work for like ten minutes before I just wanna hug you again. Aww. <laughs> no, but then you'll like find other ways to guilt me. I'll like guilt you while still cuddling. <laughs> It'll you'll, be, you'll, you'll be, uh, what's that term? You'll be passively, aggressively cuddling me. Sarcastic cuddling. Yeah. No, no, no. You'll be yeah. sincerely cuddling me, but it'll be like, yeah. you know, being mad. There will be guilt cuddles. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll probably get tested again. Then. No, I'm, I'm sure I'll be fine. All right. So when we come back next time, uh, I might go back to the theaters again very soon. Who knows? Yeah. For another movie that Corey won't see, but I'll brave it out there, and maybe I'll see it with another guest. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, but until next time, I'm Jack. I'm Wifely Dewey's Corey. And The Wages of Cinema is... <laughs> well, because I have to go say things backwards, because that's what happens in this movie. Oh, I have to mention one last point. Because one other thing, I was about to end this, but if you've heard about the sound mix of this movie that's too loud because that's the other thing that people are talking about it at times is very loud yeah it's very loudly mixed and i'm not joking there is at one point a cameo from <laughs> seriously there's an inception so inception good night